this happens to be a little series not only about faith, but about my faith. Uh, and I'm grateful that you would, uh, knowing that, would still choose to attend and be here. Returning to my academic roots in New England this weekend has reminded me uh, today, and I stand with a marvelous congregational cleric who ha a century ago had a little parish in Springfield about equidistant from New Haven and Cambridge, which seems appropriate today. And he said a hundred years ago, and I quote, the loss of respect for religion is the dry rot of social institutions. The idea of God as the creator and father of all mankind is to the moral world what gravitation is in the natural. It holds everything else together and causes it to revolve around a common center. Take this away and any ultimate significance to life falls apart. There is then no such thing as collective humanity, but only separate molecules of men and women drifting in the universe with no more cohesion and no more meaning than so many grains of sand have meaning for the sea. In the Western world, and I've, forgive me, I'd much rather just talk to you, but we're tight on time, and so I'm, I'm being concise by reading, and then we'll have questions and answers. In the Western world, religion has, has historically been the basis of civil society as we have known it. And if I am not mistaken, men and women of the law are committed to the best, that is the most just, civil society. So thank you for taking religion seriously. You will not only be better attorneys, but you'll be closer to the truth in your own personal lives. Now, you've invited me to speak for a few minutes about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I hope I can tell you something of what I believe and why I've committed my life and my loyalty and everything that I hold dear to that belief. 189 years ago, an angel, and if you want to know us, you have to know we believe in God and angels and divine manifestations of all kinds. An angel appeared to a 17-year-old boy and told him that, and I quote, God has a work for you to do, and that your name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. That angelic declaration seems to continue to be fulfilled, for good or ill, as was prophesied, as various political, social, and cultural, to say nothing of religious events, swirl around the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I can understand that it's a little shocking, because it's shocking to me, to have had not one but two Latter-day Saint candidates vying for the presidential nomination of their party. And I confess, I did not believe I would live to see the day that taxi cabs in Times Square would be scurrying about with taxi toppers saying, see the Book of Mormon. Of, <laughs> of course, our quick rejoinder has been, now you've seen the show, read the book. Uh, and so it goes. <laughs> not much of any of this, the contemporary hoopla, will have meaning for you if you don't understand some of the basic things that make us the religion that we are. So I'm going to leave that part to the question and answer and go back a little earlier. In 1820, this young man to whom I have referred, named Joseph Smith, a more American name you could not have, desired to know if the true original church of Jesus Christ was on the earth, acting on pure faith, in response to a single biblical verse which invited any seeker to pray and ask God just such questions, this then 14-year-old boy prayed vocally for the first time in his life. In response to that prayer, what happened next is, to believers like me, the most important revelatory event for mortals to have witnessed or to have heard about since that little band of disciples gathered near Jerusalem to see the resurrected Christ ascend bodily into heaven. In a vision, which the young Joseph Smith described as being above the brightness of the sun, God the Eternal Father and that same resurrected Jesus Christ appeared in at least partial fulfillment of the promise in the book of Acts, to which two angels had said to that earlier group, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus 
which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That day is inextricably linked with this day and any meaning my visit to you on this campus may have. There is not time to walk through 190 years of recent Latter-day Saint history since that epiphany, but suffice it to say that young Joseph Smith's declaration in 1820 is our declaration today and forever, that there was a true church once in the meridian of time in which Jesus Christ was the chief cornerstone and the personification of its divinity, with mortal men called as prophets and apostles to form a foundational footing around him. These apostles with other teachers and priests, pastors, and members in general constitute a figurative building, a church, if you will, which Paul described as being fitly framed together for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is our first testimony of Jesus Christ as the literal Son of God, of the merciful and redeeming gospel He brought from the Father to the earth to share with all of God's children and the church Christ established to be the vehicle for communicating those truths and those ordinances. But our next testimony is that after Christ's ascension, and with the death of those early apostles, the church and its divinely ordained succession of priesthood authority was lost, taken, removed from the face of the earth. So what ensued was a millennium and a half of opposing Paul's hope that there would be a unity of the faith and a knowledge of the Son of God. His plea that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. From Ephesians 4, it is commonplace to note that in the Christian world we see anything but a unity of the faith or any Christian cohesiveness that could remotely be called the building fitly framed together. There seems to be none that would reaffirm one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So it was in Joseph Smith's day this young boy prophet lamented that his region was a scene of great confusion and bad feeling. I'm quoting, a scene of great confusion and bad feeling, priest contending against priest and convert against convert, so that any good feelings were entirely lost in a war of words and a tumult of opinions. That says so very much about post-New Testament Christianity. So what brings me to you today is not a message of reformation, but of restoration. The restoration of that church, Christ established by His hand in the meridian of time, and which He has reestablished by His hand in the present time. Our basic message about Christ's restored church and its doctrine is not limited to, but might begin with, the truth that every man, woman, and child who has ever lived now lives or will yet live so long as the earth shall last, is a son or daughter of a loving and divine Heavenly Father. He is the God in whose image we were created, which is not surprising in that children are always created in the image of their parents. As the spiritual offspring of God, we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In order to gain a mortal body and experience moral growth available in no other way, a real Adam and a real Eve chose to leave a paradisical setting, Eden, if you will, to learn all that was necessary for children of God to learn, especially about living together in love and realizing that the guidance of God, that the guidance God would give them is the only answer to personal and familial, social and political, economic and philosophical problems. Because mistakes would be made in the course of that mortal education, sometimes horrible mistakes, wrenching mistakes, global mistakes, a Savior was provided in just such a plan. One who would atone not only for Adam and Eve's initial transgression, one necessary to bring the human family into existence, but also for every individual transgression made by those in that human family. The sins and sorrows, the disappointments and despair, 
the tears and tragedies of every man, woman, and child who had ever lived from Adam and Eve to the end of the world. Such a plan was necessary and such a Savior was required in it because life is eternal. Our hopes and dreams mattered before we came to this earth and they will most certainly matter after we leave it. If the following sentiment was good enough for a Harvard graduate and professor, it is good enough for me. That's a real concession, by the way, today. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not the goal. Dust thou art to dust returns, was never spoken of the soul. The Apostle Paul, that's from Longfellow, of course, the Apostle Paul said it even better. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we of all men are most miserable. Lastly, this plan, this divine course outlined for us, including the fortunate fall in Eden and the redemption of Gethsemane and Calvary, this is universally inclusive. All are children of the same God and all are included in His love and His grace. For as, Adam, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Everyone is covered, though it remains to be seen whether everyone cares. But if there is a failure to respond, it won't be because God didn't try and Christ didn't come. That is at the heart of what I've been introducing to you as the restored gospel. Now, in light of what I consider the pretty straightforward New Testament theology we've just noted, one may wonder, why do these Mormons stir up such emotions in people, and why are they not considered Christian by some? Let me conclude with just a few thoughts about that. We are not considered Christian by some, I suppose, because we are not fourth century Christians. We are not Athanasian Christians. We are not creedal Christians of the brand that arose hundreds of years after Christ. No, when we speak of restored Christianity, we speak of the church as it was, not as it became, when great councils were called to debate and anguish over what it is they really believed. So if one means Greek-influenced, council-convening, philosophy-flavored Christianity of post-apostolic times, then we're not that kind of Christian. Peter we know and Paul we know, but Constantine and Athanasius, Athens and Alexandria, generally we do not know. Actually, we know them, we, we don't follow them. Thus we teach that God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ are separate and distinct beings with glorified bodies of flesh and bone. As such, we stand with the historical position that the, I'm quoting, the formal doctrine of the Trinity, as it was defined by the great church councils of the fourth and fifth centuries, is not to be found in the New Testament. We take, close quote, we take literally at His word that Christ came down from heaven not to do His own will, but the will of Him that sent Him. Of his antagonists, Jesus said, they have hated both me and my Father. And along with scores of other references, including his pleading prayers, Jesus repeatedly subordinated himself to his Father, saying regularly one way or another, my Father is greater than I. However, having made the point of their separate and distinct physical nature, we declare unequivocally that they were indeed and are one in every other conceivable way in mind and deed, in will and wish and hope and faith and purpose and intent and love. They are most assuredly much more alike than they are different in all the ways that I have just said, but they are separate and distinct beings as all fathers and sons are. In this matter we differ from traditional creedal Christianity, but we do feel we agree with the New Testament. Next, we also differ from 4th and 5th century Christianity by declaring that the scriptural canon is not closed, that the heavens are open with revelatory experience, and that God meant what He said when He promised Moses, My works are without end, and My words never cease. We believe that God loves all His children, and that He would never leave them for long without the instrumentality of prophets and apostles, authorized agents of His guidance and direction the Book of Mormon and other canonized scripture, as well as the role of living oracles, witnesses to the fact that God continues to speak. We agree enthusiastically with the insightful Protestant scholar who inquired, on what biblical or historical grounds has the inspiration of God been limited 
to the written documents that the church now calls its Bible. If the Spirit inspired only the written documents of the first century, does that mean that that same Spirit does not speak today about matters that are of significant concern? Lastly, for today, we are unique in the modern Christian world regarding one matter which a prophet and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints called our most distinguishing feature. That is, divine priesthood authority to provide the saving sacraments, the ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The holy priesthood which has been restored to the earth by those who held it anciently signals the return of divine authorization. It is different from all other man-made powers and authorities on the face of the earth. Without it, there could be a church in name only, and it would be a church lacking in authority to administer in the things of God. This restoration of priesthood authority eases centuries of questions and anguish among those who knew certain ordinances and sacraments were essential, but lived with the doubt as to who had the right to administer them. Breaking ecclesiastically with his more famous brother John over the latter's decision to ordain without any divine authority to do so, Charles, well, Charles Wesley wrote, and I quote, How easily are bishops made by man or woman's whim. Wesley his hands on coke hath laid, but who laid hands on him? In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we attempt to answer honestly the question of who laid hands on him all the way back to Christ. The return of such authority is truly, I believe, our most distinguishing feature in our faith.